Feeling like taking a coffee break? So do I. What about we talk about comparators, something that you use probably daily in your applications? You may be thinking that you already know everything that you need to know about comparators and that there is really nothing you can learn on this subject. Let me just show you two tweets. The first one by Tagir Valif, Java champion working at JetBrains, and the second one is one of the answers given by Stuart Marks, JDK developer in the core libraries teams at Oracle. If this answer from Stuart sounds unclear to you or unrelated to the question, maybe you will learn one thing or two in this Jeb Cafe. First thing first, what is a comparator? Easy enough, a functional interface. A comparator models a method used to compare objects. Not in the sense of is this object equals to this other one, but in the sense is this object greater than this other one? Now, what could it mean for an object to be greater than another one? Actually, it is the context that defines that. If you have a list of people, maybe you need to sort them using their names. And in that case, a smaller person is a person that has a name that is before, in the alphabetical order sense, than a greater person. Here is the method you need to implement. Super simple, you could implement it with a lambda. Suppose that what you need to do is to sort the following list of strings. It turns out that the string class implements a specific interface comparable. So you can actually sort this list by just calling sorted on a stream built on this list, or directly call the sort method from the list interface and pass null to it. Using a pattern that takes a null object is not that great. Maybe having an overload that doesn't take any parameter would be a better or at least cleaner way of doing things. Anyways, in both cases, the API uses the fact that strings are naturally comparable. And it will give you the following result, which is expected. But now suppose that you need to compare your strings by their length, the shortest strings first, and the longest strings at the end. Then you need to create your own comparator. Implementing this interface is pretty straightforward. You can do that with a lambda. All you need to remember is that this compare method returns an int. And that there is a convention on this int. If a is greater than b, then a.compareB should be greater than zero. If a is lesser than b, then a compare b should be lesser than zero. And if a is equal to b, then a.compareB should be zero. So there is actually some correlation between the result of this comparison and the equals method of the objects you are comparing. In fact, when you create a comparator of objects, you should also make sure that the equals method has been overridden and that your comparator is consistent with equals. What can happen if this is not the case? Well, we'll see that in a minute. In a nutshell, bad things will happen. So, how can we implement this comparator? Well, if the length of this string is greater than the length of the other string, we should return a positive integer. You may be tempted to just return the difference of the two integers. Well, if you are, then you need to know that this code is mathematically correct, but it is not when you are dealing with integers or numbers. If you compute the difference between 1 billion and minus 1 billion, then it is okay, you will get a right result. But if you want to compare 1 billion and 100 million and minus the same number, and then you're in trouble because the difference is not what you expect. It is positive due to the overflow. And this makes your comparison fail. 
What could be the consequences of such a bad comparator? Let us consider the following code that I borrowed from a presentation that Stuart Marx did at DevOps Belgium a few years ago and that you should definitely watch. The link is in the description. Just generate 32 random numbers with the seed 209 and try to sort these numbers with this comparator. Well, <laughs> the result is not that great. What you get is a nasty exception. Comparison method violates its general contract. And by the way, this is the title of Stuart's talk. And the stack trace takes you to the sort algorithm, not to your comparator. And that's embarrassing because this is where your bug is. Your first reflex could be to fix this comparator. Well, let us do that. Now we have a ternary operator. Our comparator is not relying on the difference anymore. It directly compares the value. Let us take 32 other integers and sort them in the same way. And we get the same exception again <laughs> with the same stack trace that doesn't take us to the faulty comparator. So what is wrong with this comparator this time? Let us take a closer look. You know that integers are boxed in this algorithm and we are comparing them with equal equal in the middle of this ternary operator. And because what we are comparing are really the references to the box integers, then the result can never be equal to zero. Just a side note, yes, Stuart's choose this random series very carefully, especially the seeds and even the range between 1000 and 1100 that has been carefully chosen to trigger the bug. But would you really take the risk that such bugs could break your application? Relying on the computation of a difference to implement a comparator of any type of number integers, longs, floats, doubles, is a bug, don't do that. Trying to implement this comparator yourself is actually a mistake. Don't do that, neither. There are methods for that on the wrapper classes, just use them. We all love writing lambdas, but it turns out that the comparator interface has also a bunch of factory methods to create comparators. Suppose you have this person record and you want to build a comparator that compares people according to their last name. Super easy. All you need to do is just to call the comparing factory method, just one line of code. Of course, at some point, you will need to handle the case where two people can have the same last name. Then you would need probably to compare them using their first name. And if their first name is also the same, then compare them using their age. And by the way, because the age is an int, there is even a specialized method to create int comparators that do not box this int in an integer. Only for those of you who care about saving nanoseconds. In a nutshell, adding more elements to a comparator is just about chaining calls to this then comparing method, which preserves the readability of your code. But the comparator API does not stop there. Now you have a nice comparator that you can use to sort a list of people. Suppose you want to sort them in the reverse order. Well, there is a method for that, conveniently named reversed. Two last little gems from this API. The first one, you can create a comparator that will actually use the fact that your objects are comparable with the natural order method. So for instance, to sort strings of characters in the reverse order, you can create a comparator with a call to naturalOrder.reversed. Super slick, I just love this kind of pattern. And the second one, if you have to deal with null values in the list you need to sort, you have factory methods for that. Just pass your comparator to the nulls last or nulls first factory method and the API will take care of these new values for you. 
All right, so let us go back to this Twitter conversation and see another problem that you may have with comparators. There is one property that your comparators must have, which is that the results of your comparisons must be consistent. So put that at some point, an algorithm from the JDK or from any other API sees that the object A is greater than some other object B. If later on this algorithm has to compare A and B again, well, it may assume that the result is the same and that A is still greater than B. And if it's not the case, then bad things may happen. Does it mean that A and B should be immutable? Well, not necessarily. But if they are, then you are in a safer situation, no doubt about that. At least the fields of A and B that are used to compare them should be immutable. Let me show you one last example about what could happen if this is not the case. Let us create a point class that is wrapping a single coordinate, x, and make it comparable. The contract of comparable is the same as the contract for comparator. You can see that the compareTo method is OK. No funky computation of a difference, no sneaky boxing or unboxing, everything looks fine. The only weird things in this class is the hash code method that always returns zero. Bear with me, there is in fact a good reason for that. But don't get me wrong, even if you should absolutely avoid that in your application, it actually does not violate the contract of equals and hash code. Two instances of points that are equal do have the same hash code. Let us now generate a series of points, 10 of them, and let us put them in a hash set. Great. Now, let us take the fifth point of the list. It has been added to the set, so we expect to find it in the set. Let us check that, and indeed, if you run this code, you will see that P5 is in the set. Now, let us modify P5 and give it the value 50. Let us check what does contains return. Well, it returns true, which is expected. You know that a hash set internally builds a hash map and stores your object as keys in this hash map. Internally, a hash map is built on an array. When you add a key value pair to it, it computes a special hash code based on the classical hash code from the object class that determines in which cell of the array this key value pair should be stored. This specific hash code is optimized so that the probability of having two different keys ending in the same cell is as small as possible. This probability cannot be zero. When looking for a key, the implementation of HashMap first looks for the hash code of that key. It turns out that the hash code of point is always zero, so it has not been changed, which is good because if it had, then the result of contains could have been false. The call to contains would have searched for our object in a wrong cell because this object is actually in a cell that corresponds to the previous value of the hash code, and it probably would not have found it. But the hash code has not been changed, it is still zero, so contains is happy, it checks for the elements stored in that cell and finds P5. Bottom line, you should not mutate an object used as a key in a hash map, and because a hash set is built on an hash map, you should not mutate an object once it has been added to a hash set. At least not mutate the fields used to compute equals and hash code. OK, but this has nothing to do with comparables, so let us move on. Let us make this set a little bigger. Let us put 20 points in it and run the exact same code. Let us get the fifth element of the list and check if it is in the set. And it is, so everything is fine. Let us now mutate its value to 50, just as we did, and now contains returns false, which is annoying because it's different from the previous case, but we haven't changed anything. 
apart from the fact that we put more elements in our set. We are looking for an instance that is in the set, but we couldn't find it. What could have possibly happened? Well, it turns out that HashMap has a special optimization to handle collisions. What is a collision in a hash map? Internally, a hash map is built on an array and it computes an hash code to put the key value pair in a specific cell of this array. The probability of having two different keys in the same cell is low, but it's not zero. And actually, this example is tailored to create collisions. You see? The hash code of our point class instances is always zero, so all the points we add end up in the same cell. So what is happening if two different keys end up in the same cell? Well, this is precisely what a collision is, and the HashMap class has in fact two strategies to handle this case. If there are not too many collisions, then the different key value pairs are put in a linked list. To find a key value pair in such a list, you need to scan all the elements of the list one by one. So, our object is found even if it has been mutated. But this process of scanning this linked list is slow. So, if there aren't too many collisions, instead of creating a long linked list, a red-black tree is actually created. Finding an object in a red-black tree is much faster than in a linked list because you do not need to scan all the elements for that. A red-black tree is such that when you look at a node of the tree, you know that all the children elements of that node that are on the left of this node are smaller than the current node, and the one on the right are greater. Hmm, what could happen if you mutate an object from this red-black tree, such that the ordering of the elements is changed? Well, the answer is simple. You lost this element, there is no way you can find it again. By changing the order of the elements, you violated the subtle rule of the comparison contract. Once the API saw that an element A is smaller than an element B and smaller than C, it will assume that it will always be the case, no matter what. So a mutation of A, B, or C that would change the order leads to bugs, and this example is one of them. Actually, if you do that, then the result of a call to set.contains or map.contains key becomes unpredictable. This is how sets are working. And the bottom line is, if you modify an object when it has been added to a set, then you may be in trouble, so just don't do that. OK, let us make a quick wrap-up. Use factory methods from the comparator interface to create your comparators. You can also chain them with the available default methods. Use integer.compare and alike to compare numbers and nothing else. <laughs> Use immutable objects when you can, or at least don't rely on mutable fields to compare your objects, whether with equals, compare to, or a comparator. And with this, I'm out of coffee. So that's it for today. Talk to you soon. <laughs>